How might the unique minds of Andy Warhol, Nikola Tesla, and Albert Einstein reveal the potential of neurodiversity? Very often when we have different brains, it leads to exceptional abilities. Neurodiversity is the idea that there are different types of brains, different ways of thinking. This conversation not only defies the traditional, conventional, and deficit model for autism, but it also provides practical insights into how communities, teachers, and parents can unlock the potential of every learner. In this episode, we talk to autism experts, Temple Grandin, Steve Silverman, and Barry Prezant. So without further ado, what is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is the idea that there are different types of brains, different ways of thinking, and that the best world that we could have is one in which every person with every type of brain is given the best chances of success and we all work together. Temple Grandin has been talking about this for years. She talks about how when she read about the collapse of a hotel lobby, I think it was in the news some years ago, she almost instantly knew why it had happened and that it was her autistic ways of thinking that allowed her to uh, get to that so quickly. So neurodiversity basically says that diversity of kinds of minds is as essential to the success of human civilization as biodiversity is in a rainforest. This is not a radical idea, you know? Yeah, and this really gets to the neurodiversity movement. Let's understand that we all have different brains. I mean, I have a different brain than you, so neurodiversity spans and blends into so-called neurotypicality. And because we have different brains, we view the world socially in a different way. So I'm the kind of person, you may not believe it now, but I'm the kind of person who is more skewed towards liking more alone time. And I don't like being around a lot of people and having to schmooze and make small talk. If you take that to, ex to the extreme, many autistic people say that. I, it's a waste of time. Why do I need to do that? Okay. Mm. Um, so if we look at the fact that we have different brains, we process the world, we process sensations differently um, to an extreme in autism, some people with autism are hypersensitive, overly sensitive to touch or to sound or visual stimulation. And we say it's a difference. Then that allows us to be more respectful. And so the analogy that's often given is we have embraced biodiversity for so yes. long, right? And why don't we look at the fact that our neurological systems, even within our species, are so different from each other? And our brains are so different from each other that we need to look at those differences, which results in different behaviors and different behavioral patterns as something to understand and respect and not to pathologize by saying, okay, that's just less than, and that's just something in some cases that we have to kind of discourage that behavior um, or discourage the way that person is in the world. I love that because, I mean, study after study shows that the more diverse a system is, the more complexity that exists, the stronger that system is. So, of course, that must hold true for thinking. We don't want everybody trying to think the same way. What fun would that be? Right. Yes. So, might you speak to that of some of the the opportunities that come with having those different frames of thinking, of having I don't know, diverse representation on the spectrum? For example, when I worked on my visual thinking book, mm -hmm. I wrote the rough drafts. And Betsy, my verbal co-author, kind of straightened out my kind of associative, not very linear writing. So that's different minds working together. One example of neurodiversity that I think would be really helpful for kids to hear about is big cats. The more... Okay, yes. Yeah. yeah. There's a really interesting paper. It's called Solitary Mammals as a Model for Autism. All right, let's take the cat family, especially the big cat. Lions are more social than tigers, leopards, or panthers. And there's some overlap here with autism genetics. Is a panther got a disability? You see, in the milder forms, it's just a personality variant. The lions are more social, and the panthers and the leopards are more solitary. And there's overlap genetically, some of the hormonal stuff with autism. And I think in its mildest forms, it's a personality variant. Now, obviously, if a kid has no speech. Game teacher. Uh, that's obviously a disability, but some of the nonverbal individuals with autism can learn to type independently. And that is something that needs to be done. I love it. The other big aha for me from your book, beyond like just the history of autism, was the connection between 
ADHD, autism, and genius. Might you speak to that a little bit? Become obvious that in some ways, these atypical brains can work better. Um, for you know, savant abilities have been talked about in autism for a long time, where somebody could you know instantly calculate the value of pi to hundreds of digits. Yes, that's interesting. But there are other abilities within autism that uh, are you know not quite as like spectacular as somebody calculating the value of pi but that could still be useful skills and are still just cool in a sense. Even the autistic ability to hyper-focus, a word invented by neurotypicals. The, the autistic community uses the word monotropism for that hyper-focus. And, you know, people with ADHD have been studied and are known to know how to, for instance, delegate tasks to other people so ADHD, a lot of entrepreneurs who are successful, it, it turns out, have ADHD. To me, these diagnostic terms like autism and ADHD are, it's like they're not as clean and crisp as in life as they are in a book. Right. So that, you know, these are basically concepts that we stamp onto human behavior. And a lot of people are now, you know, there's a very popular hashtag on TikTok. A U D H D for people who have, you know, are somewhere in the margins between autism and ADHD. I think this is very common. And something that Asperger wrote that I've never been able to get out of my mind because it's so true is he said, once you learn to recognize the distinctive traits of autism, you see them everywhere. And that is certainly true. And, you know, you even see them on, you know, in pop culture shows on TV now, you know. Well, and every so, book you read and every right. interaction, you go, oh, right. okay. Right. I, I think the notion that autism is not rare needs to be expanded to include the idea that autistic traits are very common. But that does not mean that everyone who has autistic traits needs a diagnosis. Hmm. Basically, if you're... Um, really struggling in your life uh, in ways that services that could become available to you as an autistic, as a formally diagnosed autistic person, then it's worth seeking out a diagnosis. But in many places in the world, not just America, um, diagnosis is a very arduous and expensive process. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, waiting lists that can last for years. They can, it can be very expensive. So for people who are, you know, not upper middle class, diagnosis can be really um, hard to get. Um, and so now there's the phenomenon of self-diagnosis, people self-diagnosing via TikTok. I wonder if it's almost more of like a mindset shift of just being curious about your neuro tendencies. Um, yes. Removing the idea that there is a neurotypical and just yeah. recognizing that there's they're a continuum of habits and traits and skills yep. and ways of processing. And, you know, you're going to fall at different points in that continuum. Right. right. And I think just having a more open and curious dialogue about that, because that's how we compensate learners versus stigmatize them. That's very well said. And one of the most pointed things that Lorna Wing told me when I interviewed her, you know, I mean, she, you know, based on Asperger's work, she literally came up with the concept of the spectrum. And I, I asked her whether there was any misconception about the spectrum as she conceived of it. And she said, oh, yes. The problem is people think of the spectrum as linear, running from less autistic to more autistic. Um, she said, it's not supposed to be linear. It's supposed to be three-dimensional mm. so that every individual occupies a unique point on various axes in these continua. So I, wow. I think people are discovering that they have autistic traits, they have traits of ADHD. Is there any, are there any kinds of accommodations or support that could help them, you yeah. know, work with the way their minds really work? How your really brain work? ticks. Yeah, Your brain exactly. ticks differently than exactly. mine. Let's figure exactly. out how it ticks and it's not bad or good. So if a student is a visual learner, they can use visual media to teach that lesson. If they're an auditory learner, and I'm not, you know, carving students right. up into these convenient categories, but, uh, you know, for instance, I don't like listening to audio books. You listen to my book on audio. I've never even done that, actually, <laughs> believe it or not. 
Um, but some people really absorb the material in books better through their ears. I do it through my eyes. All my, I have to get new reading glasses. <laughs> it's getting hard. But, uh, but anyway, so yes, why not take the natural diversity of the universe and the natural diversity of human minds and give everyone the best chance of success? Yes. I think for such a long time, the language around autism was let's find a cure. Yes. Right. And like you said, we're shifting away from that. We're depathologizing it. How do we help our community to catch up and move away from that deficit thinking and really understand that? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, since you uh, had an interview uh, with Steve Silberman, let's go back to Steve. OK. Uh, one of the beauties of neurotribes is that he talks about people even before the word autism was used as a diagnosis who clearly were on the spectrum. Right. And, and the great, incredible benefits that they offer to society, whether it's a Nikola Tesla uh, invented alternating currents, something that we all use every day, the Albert Einsteins of the Temple Grandins, <laughs> um, and, and just going on and on talking about that very often when we have different brains, it leads to exceptional abilities. Mm. Um, but I just don't want to give examples, you know, of people who have very high level exceptional abilities. There are many autistic people who really contribute in other ways, um, in employment with strong, very strong visual spatial skills. So when you get people who, and I, I love this quote, you know, people say, well, a lot of autistic people think out of the box. And then some of us who've been around autism for a while, we say, well, it's not that they think out of the box. They don't even know there's a box there. <laughs> yeah. So you get people who are incredibly creative, who come up with, in everything from finance to art, come, I mean, Andy Warhol was clearly on the spectrum. Um, some people believe Bob Dylan um, is on the spectrum. Uh, I'm not diagnosing. I'm just saying, Yeah. if you Google this, you'll see all these names. <clears throat> and these are people who have been incredibly creative in their line of work. An example from an everyday person, um, Carly Ott is um, an autistic woman, late diagnosed, as many women are, in her late 20s. And she is a vice president in the Bank of America mm -hmm. because, and we interviewed her on our podcast, and she's a friend. Um, and Carly says, I just found out once I was diagnosed that I have a brain that comes up with very creative solutions to financial problems. And luckily, she had mentors who saw that, and she was nurtured within an organization that valued that. And and she, after, and this is not new news, you know, she's written about it, she talks about it on our podcast, after being severely depressed and suicidal because she didn't understand why she was so different and how people were treating her, yeah. once she got the diagnose, diagnose in her late 20s and got the support... She blossomed. She flourished. And yes. I see this over and over and over again, that once we see the unique differences in autistic people, it, very, it often opens up all kinds of possibilities for them in their lives. I think, honestly, this has been my biggest aha of the year, like between looking more into autism and just generally education and AI. It's this, this understanding that we need to move away from deficit thinking in general in education and move towards these rigid, Yang Zhao calls it the rigid profile of student strengths and passions, yes. right? There are aspects of autism that are disabling. There's no doubt about that. We're not sugarcoating autism. But there are aspects of autism that are potential strengths and enabling. And so moving away from a deficit checklist approach, get away from the deficit checklist approach. Let's have a balanced view of a person and let's see those seeds of potential. Because it's not just, oh, it's nice. He pays more attention to that or he likes to do that. It's supporting her mental health. Mm. So that child who is demonstrating that passion, that enthusiasm, that relative strength, it needs to be nurtured. In many cases, it's not going to happen on its own. Beautiful. I wonder, so I'm wondering if you have any other advice for teachers or school leaders <clears throat> out there. If you wish everyone knew something about autism, is there another message that you'd have or would that be it? Just the, the beauty of diversity? Yes. 
the, I think one of the main messages is that my research into the history of autism in a way showed generations of parents learning the same lesson over and over again. And that was the dire predictions that even your most trusted, um, you know, pediatrician tells you about your kid with autism. They often turn out not to be true. And mm. if you give the kids the resources they need, they often turn out to be in much better shape than predicted. And I'll give you a, a huge example. In the introduction to my book, Neurotribes, I talk about uh, a girl who was, her father was told by her pediatrician when she was diagnosed with autism, there is very little difference between your daughter and an animal. Oh. We have no idea what your daughter is going to be capable of. Well, what that young woman was capable of was she just got a master's degree. <laughs> So, you know, and then I interviewed an autistic guy um, who had been diagnosed by Leo Connor himself. Wow. And and he told me, he said, Connor told my mother to put me in an institution. So she did. Yale. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not saying that all autistic people turn out to be geniuses or anything. I'm saying that all autistic people deserve the chance to live up to their highest potential. And uh, the predictions made early in autistic lives often uh, turn out to be needlessly dire. This is really important, sorry. Um, you know, sometimes people will say, they'll look at Temple, you know, she's a very articulate, self-possessed woman. She's written several best-selling books. She's on top of her field of industrial design. And they'll say, my kid is not like Temple Grandin. My kid smears poop all over the walls. You know, how, how can you even say that, you know, Temple Grandin and my kid have the same condition? Here's the thing. You're not seeing Temple Grandin when she was five. Right. When, when Temple Grandin was five, she was being dragged out of church for having meltdowns because the skirt she was wearing, which was wool for Sunday church services, was itchy. You're not seeing her being thrown out of schools. You're not seeing uh, her being recommended for lifelong institutionalization and her mother objecting to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not seeing her figure out with the help of a science teacher what she was really into. And that's what got her out of being institutionalized. And so people tend to look at older autistic adults who, hello, develop like older neurotypical adults. Well, and as yeah. teachers, I think we need to hear that, that yes, it, it will be challenging. There are going to be challenging <clears throat> moments, yeah. but the solution isn't, okay, we'll just lock them away in an institution. It's that right. it, how do we lean into this? How do we make opportunity to embrace those passions and that unique way of thinking versus just trying to get them to think and act like everybody else? Yeah, that there is, there's beauty and genius at the edges of our understanding. And so exactly. it might be scary, but just open up, lean in, tune in, because that passion is what's going to, I think ultimately is what's going to save humanity. I don't know if I'm too eternal of an optimist there. No, no, absolutely. You know, and, you know, sorry to keep coming back to this, but, you know, I mentioned that my husband and I were watching this documentary about Wayne Shorter, who seemed very spectrumy <laughs> to us, this new documentary called Zero Gravity. And there's a moment when he's, going to elementary school when he starts cutting class because he goes to the local movie theater where they had big bands playing, you know? Mm. And so he gets into trouble, you know, Wayne, please come to the principal's office, you know, et cetera. And a, a very wonderful teacher um, said, you know, what are you what doing? Are you doing? Why, why are you going to that theater instead of class? It's like, I, I like the music, you know? So what the teacher recommended was instead of disciplining, you know, this boy, put him into a music class with a really good teacher. He ended up becoming one of the most influential people in the history of jazz. You know, imagine if that teacher had not existed or had instead said, this kid has to learn to buckle down. He's a problem. Put him in attention. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, one teacher can not just make a difference in an individual life. They can make a difference in world history, history uh, by supporting kids' interests. 